says, and he wrote a letter, it's called 1 John, and really I like to call it our holy assurance policy. This world has insurance, you can buy insurance, but there's no assurance. But we have a holy assurance in Christ, don't we? It is powerful. And we're going to look at, and in this assurance, there's lots of testing. And that testing actually helps us know what the truth is. The testing leads us to truth. And um, we're going to look at the love test, the test of love. Now, love is important. There's love stories, love novels, love seats, love letters. We all love chocolate. I mean, we love a lot of things, don't we? Love is important. And, but what is love? It goes beyond merely feeling. It has, to, it has to have a truth to it. And love should be able to be tested and then withstand the test. And that's really what we have here. In fact, 1 John 3 verse 10 ended this way. We, we are God's children. We should love one another. And he's going to go into it. Describe that love then in 1 John 3 verse 11. This is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. In other words, there's, there's no new life in you. We have to love. Verse 10, uh, 15. <clears throat> Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. This is how we know. That we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence whenever our hearts condemn us. For, in other words, whenever there's trouble, we can still love in the midst of it. For God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Praise the Lord. Dear friends then, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him everything we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded. Those who obey his commands, notice how many times it keeps saying commands. We are commanded to love. Anyone who obeys his command, those who obey his commands, live in him and he in them. This is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the Spirit he gave us. So our love will be challenged and tested constantly. Isn't that true in our lives? Everywhere we go. Verse 11 says, this is the message you heard from the beginning that we should love one another. We should have, would have, could have. We were supposed to love one another. We should. It's expected of us because we're children of God. We have been loved by God and we're supposed to reflect that same love to those around us. In fact, this is John's love theme in this letter. We, it, we will allow the test of love, and we should allow it to test our lives. Gee, am I loving like I should? And it says in verse 12, don't be like Cain. I'm gonna, I want us to look at Genesis chapter 4. If you go to Genesis chapter 4, it's no accident that it comes after Genesis chapter 3. If you know what happened in chapter 3, obviously the very first thing that happened in chapter 4 reflects chapter 3, the G3 complex. And it, it's, it starts here in Genesis 4, verse 1. Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now, notice it's clear that it mentions that it's his brother. There's a unity there that should be there. We don't want to miss this. Direct descendants of Adam and Eve after the fall. <clears throat> Now Abel kept the flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And, but Abel brought fat portions from the, some of the firstborn of the flock. Now we're not really told necessarily why they were doing this. I guess before the law. But I, I, obviously it's to honor the Lord in some way. 
We're not told that we, until later in the Bible for various reasons. But we have a little insight here. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. They're together. And on Cain, though, his offering did not, he did not look with favor. Now, this is not class warfare. This is not farmers versus shepherds. You can read all kinds of people that are upset about this. They, they don't allow the God's truth to penetrate. They have all kinds of different reasons why this... It, it's not a lesson in animal sacrifice. It's a lesson that God knows our hearts. He knew that, that Cain was given an offering that, that really... He didn't care. But Abel did care. And it's the heart issue that he was after. It's a lesson that God knows our hearts. And he called it before it even happened. And Cain's reaction proves God right. Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. It says very angry. In other words, it's, he's not pretending and he wasn't hiding. His face was very angry and he was very downcast. And next we have an absolutely amazing, amazing grace thing happen. The Lord visits Cain. See, the Lord had never left Cain. He's still with him. He's going to try and conjure him into doing what is right. The Lord was with Cain. And he knows his heart. Verse 6 then says this. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you just do what is right, will you not then be accepted? In other words, just do, do what you're supposed to do in your heart. The gospel, you could say, was preached to Cain in person by the creator of the universe. Right there in person. And the gospel really has two sides. Verse 7 then says this. But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. See, God, he's just really asking for Cain to do what is right. Is that so wrong? To ask somebody to do what is right? That's what God is asking this world to do right now. Just do what is right. Bow before me. Is that wrong? Well, to half the world it is wrong, or more than half. It sounds so easy, but it's the right thing to do. And really, it follows really the biggest word in the Bible that still affects this world today, and that's only two letters, if. If. If people just do what God says. If. If you do not do what is right, there's going to be trouble. If you do not do what is right. It's such a fine line, razor sharp. It splits all of humanity. God preached the gospel to Cain. Cain has a free will to say yes or no. The if will go into effect. Let's see if he will obey. Verse 8. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let us go out into the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Well, how wicked is that? Notice that Abel is just not called Abel. He's called his brother Abel. There's a close relationship here. We're not supposed to miss this. He's called his brother many times. It's a family unity here. Cain tricked his own brother out into the, get out in the middle of nowhere and he killed him. Verse 9 then. So the Lord said to Cain, well, where's your brother? Where's your brother Abel? Again, emphasizing brotherhood. Where's your brother Abel? Kind of like what God said to Adam and Eve. Remember the... He entered the garden. Where are you? See, the, the relationship is broken. God knows something isn't right. He's revealing Cain's heart. So Cain's heart is revealed, and his answer reveals and proves God is right. Here's, here's his answer. I don't know where my brother is. Am I my brother's keeper? So not only is he lying, but he's sassing, back-talking God, right, to his face. This is how bad Cain is. So verse 10 then, of course the Lord knows all about this, but this is so we can see it. Verse 10, the Lord said, what have you done? Can they say that to the whole world? What are you doing? Then he says, listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. In other words, God's justice is real. And blood is a sign of life and something wrong has happened and it's crying out to me. Unjust, your brother's blood cries out to me. <clears throat> so God knew the hearts of Cain and Abel. And uh, rejecting Cain's offering was not based on the offering as much as it was based on his heart. What was in his heart. He had no faith, no, no belief, no trust. He didn't care. 
Both Cain and Abel were fallen sinners. God was not showing favoritism at all. Cain was given a miraculous chance to repent, wasn't he? And turn. In fact, in Hebrews 11, which is the faith chapter, Hebrews 11, it mentions Cain and Abel. It says, Abel offered his sacrifice in faith. He was trusting God. He had a belief, but Cain had, had no belief at all, and God was trying to reveal that and get him to change. So we, in our lives, had better not be like Cain. We had better repent and turn to the Lord again and again. That if is still in our lives. If we're to believe God's message. Back to 1 John 3 then. A, a good mirror to look into our hearts is the test of love. Verse 12, 1 John 3, 12. Don't be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one. In other words, he's, he's acting like the evil one, not God which is Satan, of course, the evil one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. See, we're, we're to be like God. We're God's family. So we're to represent him and to be like him more and more. Don't be like the other side. Be like that less and less. Be like God more and more. We're to grow. And it's no accident that Genesis 4 follows Genesis 3 because it's more than chronological order. It's evil started in chapter 3 and we have the first evidence of it in chapter 4, the way of Cain. And I think that way is still alive today in our culture, everywhere in this world. So verse 13 in 1 John 3 says, don't be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. Jesus said the same thing. I've called you out of the world. That's why the world hates you in John chapter 15. So 1 John 3, 14, here's the test. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. So in other words, we know we have, we're born again. Now there's this love in us that maybe wasn't there before. We can even love the unloving. That takes a little strength, doesn't it? We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. In other words, you're not born again. And he's using absolute answers. Obviously, we're going to fail here and there, but he's, talking to, he's using absolute points. Verse 15, anyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. In fact, in the book of Jude, he calls really the way of Cain. The way of Cain is to live a rotten life in the book of Jude. But now we have the way of new life, don't we? So we can follow the way of Cain or the way of new life in Christ. So our test of our love really leads to the act of our love. And Jesus really has given us a lesson to this in 1 John 3, 16. This is how we know what love is. And here's the lesson. We can look at Jesus. Jesus laid down his life for us. 1 John 3, 16. We can go to school on Jesus. We can be like him. Look what he did. The greatest example you could ever get in the world. In fact, he talks about this. You can see it in John 13. John chapter 13, Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross. He's having the last supper, you could say, with his disciples. Here's what it says. I mean, he's getting ready for the last supper. Here's what it says in John 13, verse 1. Just, it was just before the Passover feast. Because Jesus will die on the cross at Passover. So it's just before it. You know, it's very important to know Jesus knows everything that's happening. And John will really emphasize this. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Now, how's he going to do it? Via the cross. That's how he's going to get there. He knows it's the time. And having loved his own who are in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. He's going to give a demo of his love. Verse 12, <clears throat> the evening meal was being served and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus already knows the betrayal is going on, but he's still loving. Verse 13, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God, that he is returning to God. With all this power, he's still going to bow lower. And that's what love does. Uh, <clears throat> verse 4, so he got up from the meal took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. He's going to be a servant. He's wrapping a towel around his waist. Verse 5. And after that, he poured water into a basin and then began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around his waist. 
He's taking the lowest position to demonstrate his love. And how low is that? It's so low that Peter blows up. We're not going to read all that, but Peter blows up. You can't do this. And Jesus says, well, if I can't do this, you have no part with me. He allows him to do it. Now he'll explain it in verse 12. It doesn't make any sense. Even Peter couldn't get it. But we should get it. And Peter gets it, you know, after the Holy Spirit comes in Acts chapter 2. But here's what it says in John 3, 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Now he's going to tell them a few things. Do you understand what I've done for you? Isn't that interesting? Do you understand what I've done for you? He's going to explain it. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that's what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. In other words, take the lowest position, and that's what love does. I have set for you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who has sent him. Now, in other words, you're no greater than me, and look what I'm doing. You've got to do the same thing. And he says this, now that you know these things, and I love that he closes it this way, you will be cursed if you do them. No, you'll be blessed if you do them. That's where the blessedness comes from, the act of love. So we have this test of love that really will test us. 1 John 3, 16 1 John 3, 16. This is how we know what love is. This is the test. Jesus laid down his, love, his life for us. We also should lay our lives down for others. You won't find that in the news, will you? But that's a tough lesson. I love 1 John 3, 16. It's very much like John 3, 16. God so loved the world. Now we have 1 John 3, 16. Giving us the demonstration you can't get any lower than washing somebody's feet. That was for the servant job. Jesus gave that example. Jesus is going to go to the cross. Sacrificial love. And that's a, a, a definition of love. Now love is something we do. 1 John 3.17 says this. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can he love God and be in him? Dear children, let us love God. Let us not love with words or tongue. No, we're just speaking. But let us love with actions and truth. Love is something we do. Love is a verb. Now, I know in most love stories and love movies, I mean, they're fun to watch. But once the sentiment dies, so does the love. You, otherwise, it wouldn't be called a love story or love movie. But this is not talking about sentiment. It's talking about what we do. It's an act of the will. Sometimes love is tough. Sometimes love is washing feet. It's feet washing love, foot washing love. Sometimes it's learning to obey love, not of this world love. Take up the cross and follow me love. There's sacrificial love here, not romantic at all. It's a tough definition. Verse 18 then in 1 John 3, Dear children, do not love just with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. So we're not hiding the truth anymore. We are living it. And our conscience is involved. Verse 19 then. And this is how we know we belong to the truth. Because we set our hearts, we set our hearts at rest in his presence. In other words, we, we are obeying him. And whenever our hearts condemn us, which it will happen, right? Whenever our hearts condemn us, we will still obey him. And the reason we can is because, it's, I like this last little phrase, for God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. So no wonder we can bow. We're not, we can't hide before God. He already knows what's in our hearts. Sometimes we feel, you know, I don't feel right and I can't do it. But God already knows. Just bow to him, forget the feelings and say, God, I'm going to follow you. Submission. We lay our lives at his feet. It's a holy trust. For God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. So we're bowing to him. Now we have that command of love. <clears throat> and that will really begin with confidence. Verse 21, dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God. We see, we have peace with God and our confidence comes from him. It's a gift. Confidence can mean con with fide, meaning with faith. We have, we have a faith walk. We're faith-filled. We're confident. On the other hand, if we are conscience stricken, which can happen to all of us, we can be guilt ridden, you know, just full of guilt and uh, 
no confidence to walk. But we don't put our confidence in ourselves, do we? We put our confidence in God, and sometimes we have to obey regardless of our feelings. It could be like we're in a, a, a court, a high court of conscience, and the judge is pointing his finger at us. It's the judge has convened the court hearing, and you're on the defendant's seat, and what's your defense? I don't have any defense. I just feel guilty. I feel guilty. I feel guilty. I feel shame. Look at all I've done. My conscience is clear, but I still feel it. I feel guilty. And a voice kind of comes from the sky. Go to the cross. Go to the cross. Yeah, but I still feel guilty. Go to the cross. I feel Finally, we bow. And all of a sudden, boom, the confidence enters. We have bowed to God's program regardless of our feelings. And that's what God wants us to do. That's really a sign of maturity. When our feelings don't rule, but truth rules. Our heads will be held high. We live in the shadow of the cross. We trust in Jesus, not self. So verse 20 then, God is greater than our hearts. He knows everything. Verse 21, dear friends, if our hearts condemn us, we have confidence before God, even though our hearts will condemn us. <clears throat> I'm going to bow my knee regardless. Of, that's what com where confidence comes from. Then we will have then obedience because be, obedience is part of it. Obedience really comes from confidence and it leads to blessing. Verse 22. And we will receive from him anything we ask. Of course, limited by his will, but God will begin to answer our prayers in ways we never have anticipated. We will welcome the limitations we have of God, but he's going to be answering our prayers because we obey his commands in verse 22 and do what pleases him. And this is command, verse 23, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ and to love one another as he has commanded us to love. Obedience is a form of love. In our culture, they, I don't think they'd really, in our regular fall on human culture, obedience and love, I don't think they mix those two together. But when you think about God and his kingdom, because he rules, he wants us to be obedient. And the number one obedience is to love. In fact, Jesus will mention this in Matthew 22. This is toward the end of Matthew 22. He's going to get arrested and go to the cross. And, you know, I, I love this, the, the truth here. Matthew 22, verse 34. The lesson the world needs, but we have it in our hearts. Matthew 22, verse 34. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, those are the, the political, political uh, cultural rulers that, uh, in Israel, and the Pharisees, the Pharisees got together. They're also the rulers. One of them, an expert in the law, <clears throat> tested Jesus with a question. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to test Jesus. Jesus, which is the greatest commandment in the law? That's the entire Bible, couldn't you say? And look at Jesus' answer. I'm sure we already know what it is. He, Jesus replied, love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. That's a quote from Deuteronomy chapter 6. The greatest commandment. Love the Lord. It's a command. There's no emotion. There's no feeling. It's a will thing. We do it because it's right. The emotion will come later. Emotions don't rule us. Truth does. Love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. This is number one. Then he's going to add the second one, which is, you can understand why he would do this. And the second one is just like it. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. Then he says this. All the law and the prophets. That means the entire Tanakh, the Hebrew Old Testament. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Loving God and loving one another. How important is this command to love if we think about it today in our world, even in our own hearts? How do you command a person to love? I command you to love. They would spit on you unless they're a believer. Then they'd probably, oops, yeah, and then they'll bow the knee. So it's a, it's a learning curve we're on. And what's the shape of the learning curve? The cross. We bow our knees to him. And then what will happen, and this obedient love will lead to a fellowship that is, that is beyond belief. Fellowship. We have the ultimate supernatural confirmation in this. You've heard of super glue, right? This is supernatural glue. 
It's not of this world glue. It's the, we have the Holy Spirit helping us. That's what he'll say. Confidence, it's a, the gift of faith, the gift of love, the gift of obeying. Verse 24 says this in 1 John 3. Those who obey his commands live in him and he in them. We, we have a relationship. We are in him. We're not in Adam. We are in him. We have a relationship. In is a preposition. We have a position. We've been positioned in him. It's a full-blown miracle. We are in him. He is in us. There's a relationship. Verse 24 then, those who obey his commands live in him and he in them. And our position is in Christ. It's unbroken fellowship with him. How can we be sure? Verse 24 ends this way. This is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the Holy Spirit that he has given us. Now he's going to go on to explain the Holy Spirit more further. We'll get to that next week. But he's breaking that truth of the fact that we are born again of the Holy Spirit. We're living a whole different life now, not like the world. We have a holy assurance policy over us. Assurance through the power of the Holy Spirit. Through God, it's his gift. So what needs renewal sometimes is a sense of obedience. That's why we bow the knee. Be a disciple. Lord, teach me how to obey. That's the definition of being a disciple. Teach me how to obey. God will put his love template over our lives and show us where we need to change our ways. Lord, I have failed here. Have mercy on me. Any will and we will learn. No longer will we march through this life with a hard heart. We'll be able, we won't be like Cain. We'll be able to be instructed by God. Our hearts will be opened. The test of love will have done its work. We will worship and obey. Most people don't understand that worship really means obedience. We are obeying whom we worship. So who are you worshiping? Who are what? If we're worshiping God, we're going to obey him. If we're worshiping the world, we're going to obey the world. But we're not worshiping the world, are we? We are worshiping God. That means he's first. We put him first and we learn to obey. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for this power you have given us, this power of new life. Let that power of new life and obedience spread in our lives and let it spread across this nation. We need that, Lord. Our nation needs that healing. Heal us all, Lord. Let us walk in your obedient faith and love. In the name of Jesus, amen.